Welcome back, and thank you all for joining us for the third and final episode of Let's Get Vascular. We're going to start this episode with a very exhaustive and detailed review of vascular physiology. So I hope you're all ready. Hold on to your seats. Here we go. All right. So now, get ready. We're going to go through an exhaustive review of vascular physiology. Ugh. Okay, I'm ready. Let's do this. So we have a vessel, and all my vessels here are blue. I think it's, they're all, they've all got met hemoglobinemia. <laughs> and we've got a, an occlusive or partially occlusive lesion in this vessel. We have blood flow moving from the left of your screen to the right. We have the pre-stenotic area where flow should be relatively normal, and the post-stenotic area where we may see changes in flow. Pre-stenotic, talking about extremities for the most part, at rest we should see our normal triphasic high velocity, high resistance flow in the pre-stenotic area. It should be normal, right? Right. And I'm not going to beat this to death, but if you look at the velocity through the occlusion, it should increase drastically. Right. And then it decreases after, and there's turbulence. And then, But as you move on well beyond the stenotic lesion in the post-stenotic area, then we'll see lower velocity, low resistance flow. So the kind of the game you play when you're looking at limb ischemia is distally, you're probably seeing something like this. Our game is to trace the arteries up the extremity until we get to this. And then we know when we see this, our lesion lies somewhere between this signal and this signal, even if we can't identify the lesion specifically itself on ultrasound, because we may not be able to depending on where it is. Gotcha. That's it. That's my exhaustive review of <laughs> cardiovascular physiology. Only med school had been that exhaustive. So with this information in hand, I think we can come back to our case. So, Brandon, I'm going to have you go through our case. Okay. So, we're back to our 52-year-old female. She's got those dusky-looking digits. Pain's in her mitten. Seems like it's better if it's warm. And, again, we're thinking vascular, not only because this is a vascular ultrasound lecture, but uh, she's got that hypertension smoking that uh, we see in... I don't know, 95% of our patients here. So this is probably just Berger's disease. Why don't we tell her to stop smoking and go home? Uh, well, uh, if it's uh, anything like my last uh, couple of uh, vascular patients, um, you know, she's uh, she's got focal you know symptoms. It seems like it's only just a couple of her fingers rather than, you know, all of them. Seems like it's a little bit better if, if warm, which, yeah, maybe, maybe that increases circulation. But... Maybe it's just Raynaud's. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be the, the, you know, last provider to put those wonderful discharge instructions in and uh, have to answer to my uh, vascular surgeon in a week from now when she comes back in with a funny colored hand. You're worried about uh, the follow-up black hand? Yeah, you know, it always looks bad when uh, they, they go back in the chart review and yours is the last <laughs> name on there. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So maybe we shouldn't just blow this off. Her fingers do look a little dusky, so, all right, we'll do more. So on exam. She looks fine. She's well appearing. She's got normal vitals. The only finding on exam, and this is my little my little side pitch for physical exam is not dead. Because had there been different physical exam findings, we might have said, you know, this is probably just microvascular supportive things and keep warm and follow up. But on the exam, this patient had a decreased radial pulse compared to the other side. So this tells us if if you have a decreased radial pulse, that tells us it tells me. This is not microvascular. This is macrovascular. Right. So this needs more macrovascular investigation, which is part of the reason that I, in this case, decided to do more and do some vascular principles in sonography. So in her case, I did the Allen's test. Have you ever done an Allen's test, Brandon? Do they still teach that? To they, you do. Guys in they do. They um, do. Yeah, the vast majority of them uh, are, are usually right before an art line when someone goes, "Did you do the Allen's test? We can put it in the note." And I go, "Oh, right." Um, so yeah, they still teach it, but it's it's probably a dying art. Uh, this was one of my first Allen's tests in, you know, five to ten years. Um, but it seemed relevant in this case. And hers was abnormal. She had immediate filling with the ulnar side, but very delayed with the radial side. So I thought my first thinking was she might have a radial artery lesion here that I'll be able to find here in ten seconds on ultrasound. Um, but we'll jump into why I was wrong. But I did look at her left radial. And I saw this, right? I saw, I got a longitudinal view, but I could see, I did this first in the short axis view, and I saw a vessel, uh, it looked at least by B-mode imaging to be patent, 
and I saw by color Doppler pulsatile looking flow. So that sh it should be done, right? Yep. We're send done. her home. Send her home, right? Don't smoke, uh, or if you're gonna smoke, just wear warm gloves. That's right. Uh, that was almost my advice here. But no, I decided, you know what? Based on this exam and these findings, I'm gonna get more information about her vasculature. So I stuck a Doppler gate in her radial artery, and even though this was pulsatile flow that I could detect easily with color Doppler, I saw, and this is not perfectly aligned, but I did my best to correct my angle and get a long axis view of the vessel, bring my Doppler and angle, angle correct, and I get my spectrum, and yeah, I should have been more patient and gotten a full waveform, but I didn't. What I see, what, what would you call this? High resistance, low resistance, high velocity, low velocity? So uh, it's, it's looking low velocity. Our scale's not that high. And... and the, so critique for the operator, which was me, uh, fix your scale, man. <laughs> Decrease that scale so we can actually see these humps. But, you know, yeah. that's for another day. But uh, looking at that, you know, we, we definitely don't don't have a, a high velocity flow and i'm really not seeing those sharp peak triphasic things that i would expect for somebody's arm who's just sitting there while i'm ultrasounding them right so this is not what we should see in an extremity at rest an extremity at rest should have reasonably high velocity and definitely a high resistance pattern even if we don't know the numbers for velocities right. these should be sharp spikes with low diastolic flow in this extremity at rest and i didn't have her do push-ups or anything <laughs> So I just start tracing up. I look at her ulnar. It looks the same. Work my way up to the brachial, axillary, get into her left subclavian. What, do you, what, what would you call this, Brandon? It looks like uh, low resistance flow. It's that uh, kind of gradual slope down, not, uh, not what I would uh, typically, typically expect. And I would just say that I think the technique here is flawless. Perfect. Perfect. Yes, it's perfect. Uh, right, yeah, so these are small humps. They're not high velocity. We still see some continuous flow. This is not what we should see in extremity. So just from what we've seen already, we saw this low velocity, low resistance flow, pretty much all the way up to the subclavian. What can we conclude so far? We're not finished, but what can we conclude so far? So even though it seems like her fingers are primarily what's bothering her, it seems like she's got a vascular lesion that's you know, well above her arm. Uh, not just, uh, you know, somewhere a couple of centimeters proximal to her fingers like we might have thought when we first looked at the radial artery. Absolutely. So even though our symptoms are all the way down at the fingertips, we have a proximal lesion somewhere, and there's more to do to figure this out. So it's somewhere proximal to this left subclavian, which is grossly abnormal. And, and here's another thing you can do with vascular ultrasound, especially with limbs. If you're not sure you're having trouble, check the other side. So her right side, which is asymptomatic, I use some other invert techniques. I'm going to skip that for now. And come on, man, turn your scale up, Minardi. <laughs> What's going on? But this, this, what would you call this? That looks like nice, what looks to be almost triphasic flow with uh, basically no diastolic flow. So what I'd expect for a limb at rest, or at least what the left's supposed to look like. Yeah, so use, use the n normal extremities if you have one as a comparison if you need it. So yeah, this is her right side, high higher velocity, higher resistance flow, this is what we expect. So it wasn't just operator error uh, causing the findings on the left side. So if, we're th if we want to find this lesion, and you know, this is my, this is my life, right? I want to find <laughs> this lesion, I want pictures of this, so I can add some anecdotal literature to the emergency medicine papers. And uh, so you should do the aortic arch, right? Because we're thinking now, we're proximal, right. so we gotta think aortic arch, maybe at the origin of the subclavian artery. So we should try the aortic arch. I tried so hard, and I failed. Uh, somebody's got to keep the radiologist in business, right? Yeah, so I couldn't get one. Um, but that, we're not done. This lesion could be somewhere else, right? So even more proximal, theoretically, I guess below the arch? Could be ascending aorta or the heart, right? right. Embolic lesions from the left ventricle. Now this patient, so this is where history still, you got to take history. Had she had chest pain or any ACS type of symptoms, she hadn't. So the suspicion would be low. She did not have AFib. She didn't have a history of AFib. She was not in AFib. So those are there's lower likelihood of these things, but it's still worth taking a quick look. We've got the ultrasound probe in our hand. Uh, you know, the residents are doing the rest of the work in the department, so you know, why not <laughs> go for this, right? That's why I'm here. 
Um, so we look at her heart. We don't see any obvious like regional wall motion abnormalities at the apex to think about uh, an LV thrombus. Uh, I didn't include these, but we got views of her ascending proximal aorta. I didn't see anything obvious there. She was not an AFib. So nothing to really make us think there was a cardiac source of emboli. And even if you want to really get into your wide differential of vascular things, an ASD with paradoxical emboli is on the list of mm. possibilities. So don't forget that stuff. Um, I did not do a bubble study, so, <laughs> uh, but I thought about it. So the left ventricle is fine. I could not get her aortic arch. So it's somewhere probably between the heart and the subclavian or axillary artery that we got images of. So what would you do now at this point, Brandon? So... Uh, in a perfect world, I'd uh, call my vascular surgeon and say, look, there's a lesion somewhere, you know, you can go find it angiographically and just have done. But uh, un unfortunately, I think I'd, uh, I'd, I'd probably have to get some other imaging just at least to make the consultants happy. Yeah, so this, there's probably a couple of different ways you can go with this. And again, this is where history is important. Her symptoms were not acute. So if these were immediate acute onset symptoms, that actually influences how we're going to manage this patient. So these were symptoms for at least a couple of months that were kind of gradually getting worse. So that history, physical, not dead. I, I love to say that. So in this case, we got a CTA and we showed proximal subclavian stenosis, but still had perfusion, gradual in onset. So this patient was okay to go home, put on aspirin, counseled on, she agreed to smoking cessation, got a fairly expedited vascular follow-up and she eventually underwent angiography had a subclavian stent and has now doing very well with uh, warm pink fingers and no symptoms so that was this case it would it would certainly be reasonable to obtain vascular consultation but if you're at an outlying facility in this patient with these symptoms they don't need a transfer for an immediate vascular consult because this is a, a subacute process that as long as reasonable follow-up can be obtained and we counsel on smoking cessation and start aspirin, um, that's probably enough and good instructions on what to come back for. And you can make sure you're, you know, not listed in the deposition for the black hand. Right, right, exactly. Tell, tell a, well, part of the discharge instructions are to return for black hand. <laughs> so that's it. I start most of my, uh, my discharge yeah. instructions with, with that. Odd colors is always a great reason to see the ER doc. Return to ED immediately for blackening of insert extremity. <laughs> so, yeah, those are, that's, those are good life guidelines. <laughs> so that's really the summary of limb ischemia, and that was the difficult Doppler principles, gates, wall filters, angles of things, kind of probably some of the harder things that we could do in the emergency department with point-of-care ultrasound and vascular diagnosis. So I told you all the hard stuff so I could show you the easy stuff. So when Brandon and I were talking about this earlier, the nice thing about most of the vascular problems we care about in the emergency department is you can diagnose them with just um, B mode and color ultrasound. So I want to just quickly go through the, a couple of those things since we're talking about the vascular topic here. So here's just an example of an AV fistula, which may occur after instrumentation. So we've got artery here. We probably see some yin-yang of flow. And then we've got high velocity flow in this vein. And when we stick a Doppler gate in this vein, we just see really turbulent, much higher velocity flow than we should see in this femoral vein. And we'll often get clues of this just with B mode and color ultrasound. But seeing something that looks kind of pulsatile and much higher velocity and turbulent in the vein than we would normally expect also can help lend credence to this diagnosis. So, and we don't, we don't have to worry about Doppler angles or gates or wall filters or much of anything to make a diagnosis like this. Pretty easy, straightforward. Yeah. Pseudoaneurysm, you seen many of these? Um, not that many uh, without uh, knowing about it beforehand, but uh, that, uh, that definitely looks like the textbook there. Yeah, so this is a femoral artery here, and this is, uh, we were able to see kind of the origin, and we can see the classic yin-yang where the flow comes in and then goes back out through a little neck in this pseudoaneurysm. So this, I often call this the hematoma that has blood flow in it. Um, that's what a pseudoaneurysm looks like. Back before the angiosteel closure devices for casts, we would see these daily. 
Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, we don't see as many of these anymore, but they still exist. They're still out there. But easy. We don't even need Doppler for this, right? We just we find a big area that looks kind of like a hematoma, and we put color on it, and we see blood flow swirling in and out of it. We can make this diagnosis in a couple of seconds. Now here is a true aneurysm. This might be in someone who had a you know knee injury years ago, or sometimes they don't have any prior history. But so this is a true aneurysm because the actual wall of the vessel is involved. And you can really make this without even color. You just B mode ultrasound is usually enough, although color can help to see that there's actually flow throughout the aneurysm. Here, part of it's clotted, mm. and we see a lot of stagnant flow here in this aneurysm. But again, we don't need specific Doppler angles. We don't have to worry about wall filters or gates. We just put the probe where we there's a lesion and put color on the vessels, and we follow it. That's all we have to do. And here, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, AV fistulas, right? You've seen them, you love yes. them, you hate them. <laughs> Patients never come to the ED to tell us, hey, my AV fistula is working fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's usually, hey, I went to dialysis and I couldn't get it because my fistula is not working. This is, this is easy. We put our probe on the fistula, we put color on it, and we try to follow it from its origin to its termination, and we can usually figure out what's wrong with it. Is it occluded? Is it fully occluded? Is it partially occluded? Is there an associated pseudoaneurysm? Is there a hematoma around it? All these things we can diagnose in, a, in a, like 90 seconds at the bedside with just no Doppler gates, no wall filters, no nothing. And then dissections. Uh, we don't often we can diagnose these without even color. We just need B mode ultrasound on the vessel or the artery of interest. Here's a carotid dissection, and we can see the flap with color on either side and the flap kind of moves throughout the cardiac cycle. So this is dissection. So other arterial problems we can solve immediately with bedside ultrasound. And just by the way, in a patient with chest pain, if you see a dissection involving the carotid, you can presume that this is an aortic dissection uh, just by looking at the carotid. And then, so kind of the last thing, just to round out this vascular ultrasound discussion is testicular and ovarian torsion, which again is always the number one thing on my differential for every patient that shows up in the ER. That's right. What kind of, so we, I'm just going to say here, we don't get, it's not practical or likely that you're going to get long axis views of the vessels and have Doppler gates and angles small enough to get in the center of the vessels here. So we just find vessels with color, we stick Doppler gates on those color spots that we see in these organs and then we try to analyze them. But we should still be able to recognize high or low resistance, and we should be able to differentiate arterial versus venous blood flow in these organs. So if I get a Doppler on an artery here, Brandon, what, what kind of pattern should I see? So we already talked about the beans being pretty important, and important things tend to have nice uh, smooth of blood flow. utmost importance. Yeah, some, some would argue more important than all the other stuff. Uh, but um, I would think they would need the, the nice kind of low velocity continuous flow rather than those uh, um, sharp spikes we see at rest in the arms and legs. I'm going to say this right here now, folks. This guy has got a future. <laughs> so yeah, ovaries, testicles, they should have low resistance, lower velocity waveforms. Any deviation from that means there's a problem. It means either we have obtained a signal that's not truly coming from the ovary or the testicle. So maybe we, we caught in some, I don't know, perineal artery. or On the ovaries, it's common we can get the uterine artery by accident. Or that means that the resistance has increased because there's been a problem like torsion or intermittent torsion. So if we're confident that we have our Doppler gate in the right spot where it belongs, kind of in the, roughly in the middle parenchymal part of the testicle, and we see high resistance pattern, that is not a normal study. That is a testicle that has been recently torsed or is doing intermittent torsion or it's partially torsed or something like that. It's definitely at risk. So don't think that's normal. So not only do we want to see arterial and venous flow in the gonadal structures when we're worried about torsion, we want to pay attention to the arterial flow being of the expected low resistance, low velocity pattern. And then we also have to remember that we can still have false negative ultrasounds, even with normal looking torsion studies, but that's a whole different topic for another day. 
Uh, thoughts on that, Brandon? Questions that you thought about that or paid attention to the Doppler characteristics and testicles before or ovaries? Uh, I, I think when I was first learning, I was more just excited the fact that I, I had found a spike somewhere that uh, was actually in the, in, in the gonads. But um, I think as I've done more well, of these and got We were all excited. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, <laughs> I think now that I've, I've done more of these and I've started looking at, you know, even some of the formal ones, you know, that I've seen done, um, it's definitely made me more aware that, you know, I've learned to pay a lot more attention, not just to, you know, what I learned in, in basic ultrasound, you know, physics, which was, okay, spikes are good. That means arteries are moving and moving on and um, a lot more kind of those small details that really don't take that much more effort to look at, but definitely change a lot of the way I, I treat patients. Awesome. Awesome. So again, gonads should have lower resistance flow. If it's deviated from that, you're looking at the wrong vessel or there's a problem in that gonad. And I think that's kind of everything we got there. There's just the summary. Gonadal arterial flow should be low resistance. And a quick summary of the things we talked about. When you want specific information, and we're mostly talking about limbs and limb ischemia, but could apply this to other areas. First question is their flow, yes or no? But then we want more specific information about hindered flow or partially ischemic lesions. We want to characterize that further. The way we want to do that is we want to get long axis views of the vessels. We want to sink that Doppler gate in the center and make adjustments to our angle and our gain and adjust our spectrum with a wall filter and baseline and scale. We need to recognize the difference between high and low resistance arterial flow and we always with vascular things need to think about from proximal to distal where that lesion might be occurring. And I think that's everything. Anything you want to add, Brandon? Anything else you'd say? No, except that I, I, I think having gone through some of this, I think I'm a little bit more comfortable with, you know, not just uh, slapping a probe on it and saying, yeah, that looks good enough. It's got some color in it. But uh, I might uh, might be a little more inclined to, to, you know, take the extra minute or two it, it's going to take and, and put that Doppler gate on there and see if I can at least uh, speed things up from my end, maybe get uh, some of our consultants to buy in and uh, maybe not have to get all that extra stuff. Yeah, and I will say, this this seems maybe intimidating at first when you haven't done it a lot, but once you learn where the buttons are and how to do these things, you can do this in just a couple of minutes. And there, all of us work in places where we don't have vascular ultrasound 24-7, even in big referral centers, it's often like a, a banker's job. So we can problem solve and figure these things out at the bedside or in other hospitals where we don't have even vascular consultants available. We can either get the information we need to say safe to go home with close follow-up or no, this is the information we need to say no, you absolutely need to go to the referral center right away with a little bit of quick problem solving at the bedside. I think this can be pretty helpful. And uh, with that, I'll thank you all for your attention. Please email us complaints or concerns.